We are in Mark, still in Mark. We have spent weeks in the Gospel of Mark, and I hope that you have been tracking along with the way that Mark is telling this story. Today, we get an incredible story of two miracles. It gives me chills to hear this story. And it's one of those literary examples of what Mark does that is one of my favorite seminary phrases. It's called a Markin sandwich. And it's where Mark takes two different stories and he kind of splits one of them like the bun of a sandwich and then puts the other like the meat of the sandwich. And so what we get in today's gospel lesson is we're introduced to the idea of Jairus and his daughter and his daughter being very sick. But before Jesus can actually get to Jairus's house, he encounters a woman. And the woman is bleeding and has been for 12 years. And she touches the hem of his garment and is healed. And then, of course, after that happens, we finish off the first story by going to Jairus' house and Jesus healing the girl who had already died. It's a wonderful way that Mark points to how two stories actually help understand each other. And so we need both of these stories in order to figure out what is actually happening in this gospel lesson. Think of the people who were actually healed. Let's start there. We've got Jairus's daughter, a little 12-year-old girl who was probably totally scared and sick for a while, and Jairus himself being the leader of the synagogue who goes to Jesus and asks Jesus' help. Now, remember, at this point in the gospel, Jesus has already been drawing a lot of attention to himself, and all of the Jewish leaders are not excited about what Jesus is doing. So Jairus going to Jesus would have really been pushing the limits of his capacity as the synagogue leader, and yet he loved his daughter enough to go to the person he knew could heal her. And then you've got this woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. So not only is she just physically weak and she spent everything that she has trying to be healed, but in that culture, blood makes one unclean. And so for 12 years, she has been considered unclean. For 12 years, she has been isolated and alone. And yet still in her isolation, she hears about Jesus, hears about this miracle worker and finds him in the city, pushes her way through the crowd just to touch his garment. And then she's healed. Now, it's easy for us as we hear these stories to focus on the miracles because the miracles are powerful. A woman who needs to be healed, a young girl who has died, who is brought back to life. These are incredible miracles. But focusing on the miracles actually keeps us from attending to the real power of the story itself because the point of the story is not actually the miracles, but what the miracles point to. Just put yourself in the shoes of all the people who were there in the street, pushing and trying to get at Jesus, and yet this woman who touches just the hem of his garment is healed. Think of all the people around him who may have needed to be healed or the people around Jesus who knew someone who needed healing and had been praying for a loved one who needed healing. Jesus didn't go to their house and heal them. Jesus didn't heal the people who may have also pushed in and touched Jesus. And so before we get too enamored by the miracle itself, let's make sure we separate out what Mark is really trying to do for us. Miracles can be a distraction. And miracles can actually lead us to the kind of lifestyle that we really that struggle. I knew a woman in Atlanta who, at the age of mid-50s, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Way too young for that kind of diagnosis. And she was very scared. And she prayed for years and years to be healed. When I met her, she was in her early 70s, and all of the terrible things about Parkinson's was beginning to set in. All of the problems and the pain that Parkinson's ultimately gives to a person was really ravaging her body. And yet, when she tells the story, she spoke of being healed. And I asked her, why is it that you speak of being healed? And she said, because I realized after praying that I was actually healed of the fear that Parkinson's had put on me. She realized that actually the prayer and the faith had been given to her to hope that what she saw and the pain she was experiencing was not all there is, and the promise that God makes through Christ that everything we see in the world and everything we experience right now will one day be made whole and be made new. We all know what it's like to struggle. We all know what it's like to be afraid. 
We all know people who are sick. We all know how it feels to pray for people to survive, to live, to be healed. And we know what it's like to lose. When we hear stories like the one in today's gospel, it might be that they inspire us. But I bet for most of us, gospel stories like the one we hear today are actually more frustrating than inspiring because the point is really not the miracle itself, but man, we sure would like one. The miracle that Jesus tells all of us through stories and acts like this is that the hope that we have deep inside, the faith that we have been given is what sustains us when the bad times happen. Now we may not see miracles with our own eyes, but the truth of these miracles resonate throughout time and are a gift to us right now. Consider what Jesus had already said about the promise of God. Consider what Jesus has already said in the Gospel of Mark about what God's kingdom is all about. Three times already, Jesus has used the image of a seed to speak of the kingdom. And I'm no farmer, but I know you don't just plant a seed in the ground and see a plant instantly. Seeds take time to germinate. They take time to sprout. They take time to bear fruit. Seeds can actually take a long time, and in some cases, years and years, to actually become the plant that they promise to be. Jesus is not mistaken by using that seed image multiple times before even this chapter to speak of the kingdom of God because the faith that has been implanted in us takes time to germinate. The promise that Jesus gives us takes time to be fulfilled. Jesus' life and ministry and miracles, they're meant for us. But Jesus' life, ministry, and miracles, they're not meant to predict what will happen to us right now. Miracles are not predictive, but instead miracles provide us hope for the way in which God can make the world new. And we are part of that hope. How we choose to live our lives, what we do with stories like this and the feelings around those stories actually become part of God's work in the world to make things new. Just think in the last few weeks, what this church alone has done, just in a few weeks. Over 100 DISD students have had a summer camp for free with field trips because of this church. We've collected over hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food to stock a food bank. We've fed hundreds of people at the largest shelter downtown. We have done so many things just in a few weeks, just outside these walls, and that doesn't even count the kind of love and support and presence we give one another right here in this room and between the Sundays. When we make faithful choices, we are actually helping to build God's kingdom day by day. We know that bad things will happen. All of us, if we've lived long enough, know horrible things can happen. Jesus' promise is not about keeping the bad things from happening. Jesus' promise is that he is with us that God is with us when the bad things happen. That when we hit that lowest point, when we go into the pit, that God does not leave us alone. God will carry us through those lowest points. When we are having the best experiences and the highest highs, we can give thanks to God. And when we are in the lowest points of our lives, we too, can give thanks because God is present in the highs and the lows. God does not leave us lonely. The promise of God is that we, as individuals, have been given the gifts to help make the world a better place. And that each one of us, through every choice we make, has a chance to impact the world and to spread God's hope to pass on faith and to reflect God's love. That kind of faith in everything that we do tells me that the best indeed is yet to come. And may we each be courageous enough 
even when we are down in the pit, to know that God never leaves us. Amen. Amen.